I'll just read, and you guys can follow along, Matthew 5, and I'm going to read uh, 1 through 16. So, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And tonight... I want to focus on that last verse, uh, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Heavenly Father, once again, I pray that you would uh, use me as your uh, vessel tonight. I pray that you would preach to all of us, and myself included. I need to hear this just as much, if not more, than anybody else in this room. And we thank you for this sermon that you gave that was recorded for us for all time to to have access to the words which you said. And I pray that as we dig into these um, different blessings and different attitudes, I pray that we would be able to take a look at our own lives and see how we compare to the way in which you say that we should live. And I just ask once again that you'd be with us tonight. And I I pray that uh, you would speak to all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So in verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So tonight we're going to talk about good works. And, you know, the good works we do, not always to be seen. It's important to do things, you know, behind the scenes sometimes. But, but when you're doing good works, you will shine before men. And that's what, uh, this is a commandment, really. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So this issue of good works, you know, we know that this is not for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's a verse that... I would say everyone in this room probably has memorized to a, to a T. We know that grace or that salvation is through grace by faith, and um, you know I wanted to just touch a little bit on the subject of works in relationship to salvation because um, I wanted to talk a little bit about repenting of sins. You know, there's this uh, doctrine that is a, an old doctrine. It's been around since before Jesus' time, and it's around to this day. And that is that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. And I wanted to have us turn to Jonah 3.10. So if you can turn there. We're going to be turning to a lot of verses tonight. So um, I marked some of them, but some of them I'm going to be turning with you. So we'll see. When I was a kid in church, I used to be the first one there. So we can, we're not going to have any races tonight, though. But Jonah 3.10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So I just want to make that point very clear, that repenting of sins is work, and that's really hard work. And for those of you who have been coming faithfully, and Brother Houston has been going through the battle, on Wednesday nights, the battle of sin and temptation, um, I was just, I told him this morning that when I told him I was preaching about, I feel like everything that he's been preaching on, that this is kind of a continuation of that. And so um, 
I hope that it is <laughs> that you guys can see that too. But you know, it's it's really hard work battling temptation and overcoming besetting sins, and that's a that's something that we all have to go through. And um, that Wednesday nights have been great, and it's been such a blessing having Brother Houston here. It's you know he said what did you say? We say no meetings, no feedings, and it's uh, he's been able to fill the pulpit, and we've been able to help him you know, pay a little bit, so that's been great, but it's been such a blessing to have him be preaching for us, you know, such a man of wisdom, and I was thinking about this too, it's, it's, he's a hard act to follow, you know, Sunday morning, and then here I am, because preaching, I feel like, I mean, the, the Bible preaches itself, but uh, preaching seems to like something that you get better with age, you know, like in my profession, architecture, I had a professor that told me that until you're 40, you don't even have your own theory of architecture, and then you don't even produce anything decent until you're 50. They're like, okay, like there you go, off into the world, go get a job, and it's gonna be 30 years before you do anything that I will consider good. You know, I, I believe that young preachers can preach great, but I mean, there's so much wisdom that Brother Houston has, and uh, it's been such a blessing. Um, also, I want to let's turn to Romans four and verse five. Romans four five. So, again, on the back to the repenting of sins. You know, the Bible does say in Romans four five that, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So I just wanted to drive that point home because since Pastor Holman has left, we've had people every week, you know, we don't know who these people are, and we've had four people who have said or hinted at this idea of this repent of sins and that you have to live a righteous life in order to be saved. And it's just, it's frustrating, and I just, I had to, I just wanted to say that. Now, that being said, we know that we need to live right. And the question is, why work? Why do we work? Why would we work? You know, we know there's rewards in heaven, and Brother Houston touched on that this morning, that he doesn't work for rewards. That's great, but he does it. Why? Because we love God. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And let's turn to 1 John 5. So we keep commandments because we love God. Also, 1 John 5, 1 through 3 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begat, begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And it's kind of like, oh, and by the way, and his commandments are not grievous. So we, this is the love of God. Just And so right off of this morning, talked about love and how much God loves us. Well, in return, we love God. We need to love God back. And so also when you're right there, let's turn to 2 John in verse 6. It says, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So the question is, how should we live? You know, there's all kinds of commandments in the Bible. Obviously, tonight we're just going to talk about these Beatitudes. Back, you know, go ahead and turn back to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to stay there. Well, we're going to be all over the place, but we'll be in there for a little bit here. So how should we live? What, how, how would people look at our lives and how can we shine before men? How are the, when they look at our lives, are they going to see our good works? So, you know, this, these uh, eight things here, they're called the Beatitudes. And that word, Beatitude, simply just means an attitude that leads to a blessing. Some of the synonyms for a Beatitude are blessedness or benediction, grace, more bliss, ecstasy, exaltation, supreme happiness, divine joy, divine rapture, saintliness, and sainthood. So why would Jesus give us a list, uh, not necessarily a list of commandments, but a list of 
ways to live life. And I believe that the answer can be found in John 10.10. You don't have to turn there, but this verse should be familiar too. Jesus says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So God, Jesus is interested in us having an abundant life on earth. He doesn't just save us for fire insurance. You know, that's what everyone says. We don't just get saved for fire insurance. I mean, it is, it is amazing. It's amazing grace. You know, we don't deserve it, but God saves us. We don't, if we believe on Jesus Christ, we do not have to go to the devil's hell. You know, the hell is not created for us, but because of our sin, we are condemned to hell. But we get saved by believing on Jesus. And then Jesus came and preached, and he wants us to have an abundant life. So again, this is the question, how should we live? And that's the title of my sermon tonight, How Should We Live? And so we're just going to take a look at these uh, Beatitudes and look at how they are attitudes, characteristics, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're the, the ways in which we should desire and strive to live. So the, very, the first one is there in verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let's go ahead and turn to Luke 18. 9 through 14, Luke chapter 18. So the poor in spirit. You know, this is not talking about monetary conditions, not poor like financially. This is poor in spirit. And sometimes when you're looking for an example, the best example is of what not to do. Okay, so this verse or this passage actually has both examples built into it. So let's read uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14. So, and he, this, he is Jesus. Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay, so here's a parable. This is a fiction, fictitious story that Jesus is telling to convey a truth. So he says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. I was trying to think of, like, you know, what, do we, what would we say in 21st century? A Pharisee, you know, a religious person, a Bible thumper, perhaps, um, and a publican, a tax collector. I was thinking the perfect example of that might be the payday loans people, okay? So keep that in your mind, like the payday loans guy, because you think of tax collector. Well, tax collectors aren't evil people necessarily, they just work for the IRS. But, you know, the, the tax collectors in this day, they were able to tax whatever they wanted, and they could add their commission and just kind of state whatever commission they wanted. So they were kind of known, you know, the story of Zacchaeus. Nobody liked this guy, okay? So here's a, a religious guy and a, a, you know, person that no one respects. Okay, so verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You know, so that's an example of not being poor in spirit. Now, here's an example of being poor in spirit. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, you know, poor in spirit is a, a humbleness. We need to be humble. We don't need to be proud. We don't need to be arrogant. And this, by the way, is also a condition for salvation. You know, we must recognize our inability to save ourselves. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, in, in this example, the Pharisee, he's basically just saying how good he is and how awesome. He just thinks, God, he's not as terrible as that other guy over there. Um, he probably doesn't know that he has come short of the glory of God. He thinks that he's earned his way. And I think that we run into these people even today. So run into these people all the time. So let's look at the second one, which is in verse 4, Matthew uh, 5. They that mourn. 
Blessed, uh, number four, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So I think this, the mourning kind of has a double meaning um, in the context of which this follows the poor in spirit. But, you know, just on the surface level, just mourning, you know, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. And I, I always would say, like, what's your favorite verse? John eleven thirty five. So if you don't know any verses, kids, like at least learn Jesus wept. You can remember that. John eleven thirty five. Okay, so you know, not only does this mourning mean to grieve the loss of a loved one, which is the context that um, Jesus wept. You know that. Um, <clears throat> Lazarus, sorry, my mind went blank there. Lazarus had passed away, and when Jesus got there, he, he wept. He grieved the loss. But also to be broken for lost souls, okay? So um, I should have said Ecclesiastes 3, 4. You know, there is a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. So there is a time for these things. And, and Jesus is saying that, you know, if you mourn, you shall be comfort, comforted. So it's a blessing to mourn. Now, I want to read, go back to Jonah, chapter 4, and this is a, another bad example of someone who doesn't mourn souls, okay? Jonah did not do the work of God because he, didn't, he wasn't mourning for souls. You had a wicked city, the city of Nineveh, and we know there's a history there about how the, you know, Jonah, his people didn't like their people and all these sorts of things. But they were a wicked city that God was going to destroy, and Jonah didn't care. And then even after they had repented of their sins, and they got right with God, and God, he repented of the evil that he was going to do, look at John, Jonah 4, 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and it was, he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? So Jonah had, was kind of wrestling with God, saying he didn't want to go. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. He didn't mourn their souls. And so he says, Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah did not mourn, and such that he would rather, his prayer was that, G, that God would kill him. He was just, had no mercy, had no love, had no compassion, had no mourning for their souls. So we need to be sad every once in a while. You know, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry, and it's, and it's especially, we need to be sad and mourn for the lost souls. And... Oh, not only um, just, you know, being sad is not in itself uh, enough always. You know, in Matthew 9, um, verse 35 through 38, uh, I, I wrote down that mourning can lead to compassion. So in 9.35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus, he had compassion and so I want to ask all of us, what, what do we do, what do you do when you mourn? And are you moved with compassion? You know, compassion is kind of like love. It's not just an emotion. It's not a feeling. It, it's a verb. It, it's an action. Like, what is compassion? You know, compassion is mourning for, the lo for lost souls and then preaching the gospel. All right, ver number three is the meek. That's verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what does it mean to be meek? It means to have self-control, having power, but restraining it. Let's go back uh, to the Old Testament. We're going to go to Numbers chapter 12. Moses was a meek man, a meek individual. You know, Jesus was a meek man. 
we need to strive to be meek. And um, I was trying to think of different examples I could use for this, but I mean, let's just take a look at Moses's life and, and what in this example, Numbers 12, 1 through 15. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So at this time, Moses is the most meek on earth. That's quite the title. Verse 4, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall behold. Wherefore ye uh, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let not her be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, she should not be ashamed seven days. Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. So this example of Moses, you know, Moses had the opportunity when they were speaking in verse uh, 1 and verse 2, he could have puffed up his chest and he could have said, I'm the man of God. And, you know, he could have said that, don't you know who I am? You know, God made me. He put me in this position. But he didn't do that. He was meek. And God took care of him. Okay? So, um, verse back in Matthew 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, God gave Moses what he intended to give him. Moses didn't have to go and get it for himself, you know. So a great example of how to be meek. You know, sometimes, you know, people want to say bad things about you. Just that's, you know, it's not really your place to put them in their place. So that's part of being meekness, having that self-control, having the power but restraining. You know, having the power to fire somebody but not, you know, firing them for that reason. But anyway, number four. They which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So that's uh, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So do you want to live right? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Do we want to live, do we want to live right? And let's look at Paul's example of how to live right. Romans 7. Romans 7 and 15 through 25. So this ties right in also with this battle of sin and battle of temptation. You know, do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? You know, the, the, this battle that Brother Houston has been preaching on, you know, if we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, you know, then we're not going to have a blessing. But here is Paul's example, and we've hit on this on Wednesday nights. Okay, here we go in verse 15. For that which I do, I do not allow. For what would I do that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do not, or sorry, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is, it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not." 
For the good that I would, would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, excuse me, <clears throat> and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So that's the inward battle that if you want to catch up on those sermons, they're on YouTube, and you can listen to, I think there's been three so far, and I think there's going to be this Wednesday, the fourth, about dealing with the, in, the inner man, having that battle with sin. But we ought to strive for righteousness. We ought to hunger and thirst for it. And in Matthew six or 5, verse 6, it says that we shall be filled. We shall receive it. All right, so let's look at the next verse. Number five would be the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, Abraham, and let's turn to Genesis 18. Abraham is an example of having mercy or wanting mercy. So this is when uh, basically God tells him he's going to destroy Sodom. So just as we saw how Jonah is a terrible example of how to be, now we're going to look at a good example of how to have mercy or plead for mercy, to beg for mercy. So um, Genesis 18, 16 through 33. So here's the story. And the men rose up from thence and, and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. That would be great if God would say that about us, wouldn't it? Verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, what was their sin? Pride. The pride of, of Sodom was sin. Verse 21, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? So God tells him he's going to destroy an entire city. And Abraham wants mercy. He's asking God for mercy, begging for mercy. You know, just 50, 50 righteous people. You know, in Nineveh, everyone got right with God. And here, he's just begging him. And that's, well, we'll get to that in back in Jonah. All right. So, verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shalt thou not, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five and fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If, if I find there forty, oh, forty and five, I will not destroy it. But he spake, and he, said, he kept going and going, and he got down to ten. And he's just basically begging God, if there's just 10, please spare the city. So Abraham strives for mercy. Okay, that's kind of, people look at our lives, they should look at us as being merciful to people. They shouldn't look at us and like, we're like biting people down. Oh, that guy got what he deserved. And like, they we're wanting people to be put in their place. You know, we should be merciful people. Okay. Um, 
So back in Jonah, you don't need to turn there, but, um, you know, so Jonah knew what God had done, you know, so he knew that he, I, I know that Jonah was aware that if there were 10 in, in uh, Sodom, that he would have spared the city. And in Jonah 4.2, um, Jonah said that he, he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled into Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful. So this is a character trait of God, that even the people who don't want God to be merciful, they know that God is merciful. So thank you, Jonah, for being a bad example. All right, Luke 18. Let's go to Luke 18. This was being merciful. 18 and verse 13. Back to the publican. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast upon the ground, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So God is merciful. Jesus is merciful. We should be merciful. Now let's look at the next one, which is the pure in heart. The pure in heart, that's verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. So, um, right here, it's on the same page for me, but Matthew 6, 1 through 4. This is later on in the sermon, talking about alms. Verses, uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So the question, what is your motive for doing things? What is our motive? What, when we do good things, is it so that people will look at us? Or is it so that we will just please our Father? And that's what the example of giving alms, you know, alms are those things which no one knows about. And um, that's a pure heart because that, you don't get your reward later. Like that, that's like true servanthood is doing it when no one's looking. You know, it's kind of like people say like, you are who you are when no one's around. Well, serving people when no one's looking, same thing. That's pure of heart. That's our, our motive for everything we do should be a pure heart. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to mow the lawn, not of a pure heart, that's fine. You can. All right, number seven, the peacemakers. And that is verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. It has been said that a peacemaker is a man who brings peace to another, but one cannot give another what one does not possess oneself. Does not possess oneself. Let me read that again. A peacemaker is a man who brings peace to another, but one cannot give another what one does not possess themselves. So if we're going to be peacemakers, we better find out how to get the peace of God. Let's go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the peace of God doesn't tell us how to get it yet. Keep reading. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on those things. Okay, those things. Those are eight things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So, how do we get peace? We do those things. Let's read verse 8 again. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on those things. So we need to think on the right things and get the peace of God. And then we can give peace to other people. All right, and then the last one is um, they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And that is verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Nope, that's verse 9. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's keep reading. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So let's, let's look at uh, John 15. John 15, verse 18 through 25. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all things, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. I had not come, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me, sorry, yes, verse 23, he that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have, their, they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So, um, let's turn real quick to uh, 1 John. 1 John uh, 2.23. He said that if those who hated Jesus, hate, they didn't know Jesus, they didn't know the Father. This is what, hang on, I better turn there. 1 John... 2.23 Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath also the Father. So here you had, in John 15, he's talking about the Jews, and they did not have, they rejected Jesus, they did not have the Father. And if you back up there in verse 22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, you know, people who reject that Jesus is the Savior, um, and that is people who have false religions. It's also people who have no religion. You know, people who believe in they're atheists or whatever. They are rejecting Jesus Christ. They are saying he's not the Son of God. Thomas Jefferson, he had the Jefferson Bible. He took out all the deity of Christ in his Bible didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He, he's a liar. You know, he has not the Father. So, um, you know, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14 and uh, verse 6. So um, let's go to 2 Timothy 3. We're talking about persecution, Be those who are persecu persecuted for righteousness' sake. I think I had that marked and I lost it. I'm losing this. What do they call that? The sword drill? I'm losing that sword drill. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then also in Romans 8. Romans 8, 14. 14 through 17. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified, that we might also glorify together. And then the last verse is Philippians 3.10. And those are on the posters. This was our theme verse a couple years ago, Philippians 3.10. We should be able to quote it, but I don't want to miss up a word. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable, conformable unto his death. So let's go back to Matthew 5, and let's just go back through the, the Beatitudes here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then verse number 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.